I thought it would be fun to laugh at horrible ways to die. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a, that's a fun little thing about, uh, you know, all the different ways that there are d to die. And, and, you know, as the song would tell us, there are millions of ways to die. But um, did you know there's only one way to live? We like to think that there are millions of ways to live, but there really is only one way. Uh, and and we, we, we like to pretend that all the different ways are all the ways that we want to come up with. And, um, and then there are all kinds of voices around us in the world to tell us, hey, you should... You should look like this and live like this and be like this. And if you do this, then things are going to go well for you. Uh, that you should, you should want these things. You should aspire to these other things. Um, and you should buy these things because if you buy these things, it will go well for you. It will be good. I'm of the opinion that you can't buy good. It's impossible. But we try. We try to buy good all the time. And we're told that we should buy into all kinds of things. <laughs> I'm sure you remember this ad campaign. So one, two, three, take my hand and come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. I say you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. Now come on, did anybody not have an iPod? Everybody had an iPod. Did you even know that band? No, nobody knew that band until this commercial came out. And then what happened? We all bought iPods and then we went and we bought the band. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 our, our hipster music director knew the band before they were cool. You're missing the, the rim glasses, you gotta get the rims, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's all kinds of things, right? We don't, we don't buy iPods anymore because we just have the ones that make call, phone calls and get on the internet. We have all kinds of things in our life that we're supposed to buy for, for status symbols, right? So everybody can know, and then, hey, you know what, it just, if you're not into high heels, gentlemen, there are still status symbols. We can be marketed brand-wise and wear all of those things and all the other brands that all end up right here over our heart. We have all these things, and you know what they are? They're delusions. They're delusions of the world that we live in. That if we buy these things, then life will be good. That life will be better. That if you buy these things, people will like you, and, and you will be able to win people and influence their life. That somehow if you own these things, that it will go better for you. That you can buy good. That, that these things are even good. And really what's happening there is this delusion that we buy into says that somehow life is wonderful and good and we have control of it and that we can do all we want with it. And then once we get into this delusion, what ends up happening is that we forget. We forget to praise God from whom this life began anyway. Because if we don't have problems, we don't need to turn to God and we don't need to and so we don't and then soon enough we get lost in our own little delusions. And we start hearing the voices in our head because we put the iPods on and now we're listening to Pandora and there's ads being beamed directly into our head. And these voices tell us to buy, 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 and you can have all kinds of things if you just buy one more thing. And all these voices are coming at us and we're trying to figure out which ones are which and which ones to follow and which ones aren't good. And, and then John, the Baptist, becomes just one more voice. Just one in a, in a loud chorus and John's voice isn't beamed into your head. And he doesn't have a little symbol that you can see on people's shirts as you walk around to remind you. If anything, if anything, the words that John said just kind of go one ear and out the other. He cried out when he saw Jesus. It says he exclaimed. That's like a scream so loud that with this microphone, if I did it right now, it would hurt. You'd all be mad at me. John went nuts when he saw Jesus. Think like all those girls when they saw the Beatles for the first time. That's what John was doing. He was going nuts when he saw them. And he said, there, 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 there. That's the guy, that's the guy, that's the guy, that's the guy. That's the Messiah. That's the one that we've been looking for, we've been waiting for. Go and check him out. This is it. He had his disciples with him. People who were looking for the Messiah. And they were hanging out with John because John was a prophet. And they understood that the word of God was with John. And so they were with John because there's the word of God. And John said, Get, go, go leave me, that's the guy. Now check out what happened. He had two disciples with him. One of them stayed put. The man that he's following, John says, stop following me, go, get over there. And the guy says, yeah, I kind of like where I am right now. I know that you're saying that that's the Messiah, and I really like the words that you say, but I'm going to hang out here. What does that say about the human condition? 
if the man that you're following tells you, stop following me, that's the one that I'm following. And then he says, ah, that's okay, I'm not going to do it. I think we can all, some of us, get there and say, well, we like the situations that we find ourselves in. And they're comfortable. And even if we know that they're wrong, it's okay. I, I can just plug the world out. Fortunately, Andrew didn't do that. Andrew heard the words that John was saying, and he left, and he went, and he went up to Jesus, and he wanted to check it out. He wanted to find out, hey, is this the guy? Is this the Messiah? And he goes up to Jesus, and he's asking him, he said, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, Jesus says these words that I want you to take with you today. They're these words that only Jesus could say, and they have so much meaning. He looked at John, and he said, what are you looking for? Would you know it if you found it? If the thing that you were looking for was right in front of you, would you actually believe it? Andrew went, and he saw all the things that Jesus was doing in that short period of time, and I'm sure he peppered questions at him. I'm sure he asked him all kinds of things. He asked him, you know, about this, and he asked him, you know, about that, and he said, hey, about this, and how about that? Because here's the thing, if this man that Jesus was peppering with questions really is the Messiah, then this isn't just awesome, this is the best, like literally the best. This is the answer to his prayers. Andrew has been looking for this man. Andrew has been looking for this opportunity because if this guy is the Messiah, then nothing else matters then all of the things of the world just fall into line and he can, he can finally have what he's looking for. Everything else can fall away. This is the answer to Andrew's prayers. Now I want you to ask yourself, think about the last prayer you had or the prayer that you make regularly. Think about that prayer. Now what would happen if that prayer were answered? Would it change your world? Or would you just have gotten to work on time? Andrew's prayer was that he sees the Messiah, and that's going to change everything, because now nothing else matters. He knows this is the Messiah, and he's so taken away by it, he goes back home, and he tells his brother, right? That's what you do. That's what you do. As soon as you know who the Messiah is, as soon as you understand that this is the goodness of God, you can't keep it quiet. You can't. So he told his brother, he said, Simon, come on, man. I found the Messiah, the guy that we were looking for, the one that John was looking for. I found him. Come on. And his brother was like, yeah, man, let's go. Let's go check it out. So they go and they find him. And Simon comes up to this Jesus and Jesus grabs him and he looks at him. He says, you, you're going to be my rock. You're going to be the thing, the person, the one that I use to bless the entire world. My house is going to be built on you. You are the foundation that millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, tens of billions of people will be blessed upon. I'm not even going to call you Simon anymore. This day is so impactful for all of the people of all of the world. I'm going to change your name. Cephas, Peter. Which in Greek means rock. You are going to be so awesome, Peter, says Jesus. My church is going to be built on you. And then through that church, the entirety of the, of the world, they're going to know who I am, says Jesus. And because they know me, they're going to have salvation. I'm going to change the entire world through you, Peter. I got big news for you. Today is your day. And Peter said, all right, man. And he went back fishing what he did he decided hey you know what that's great I'm glad that you think that I'm special I'm gonna go fish which is what he did he went back home he went back to the life that he's used to living he went back to the routines and the habits that he had built up over an entire life he went back into the boat that morning he threw his net out onto the water to Galilee the Sea of Galilee and he pulled out fish because he needed to eat. Because he had family to feed. Because he's going to take those fish and put aside some for his family. And he's going to take the others and he's going to sell them so that they could buy bread or clothes or all the other things of life. 
Thanks, Jesus, for telling me that I'm going to change the world. But you know what? I got things doing. I got a job. I got family. I got fantasy football to play. Peter denies God. God called him, looked him in the face, said, through you the entire world is going to change. And Peter said, not for me. No, thank you. No, nah, I got other things to do. And I hope that you can get with that. I hope that you recognize that we all have this calling. It's not just the ones that wear black on Sunday and stand in front of everybody. It's all of us. God calls all of us. And maybe that call isn't to be the one that the church is going to be built on. But it is nonetheless as powerful, and we still wrestle with God. And we wrestle with him, and we tell him, you know what, God, I love that you've called me. I am all about it. Here, I'm going to put you on the margins of my life. I'm going to make sure that you're in my life, but not in the middle of my life. I mean, i got things to do, you know. I can't, I can't have you in the middle of my life. You realize that that would disrupt everything that i got going on, Jesus? It took me years, decades to get here. You can't just disrupt my life like that. You can't come in here. We say this. We do this. I hope you recognize that this is a reality of the world that we live in, that our, our faith journey is. <laughs> we compromise. We give God the scraps. We say, okay, as long as it's for you, Lord, but as long as it doesn't also take away from me. I love Peter. I hope you know that Peter is the, uh, the disciple. He's the one that decided to do all of the things wrong. And he did them wrong regularly. See, here's what Peter probably would have said. He would have said, you know what, um, Jesus, I love that you want me to be in your ministry. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm a fisherman. I know how to fish. What if, just hear me out, Jesus, what if in a couple weeks, not right now, but in a couple weeks, I'll meet you up on that mountain. You can give a sermon up there, and I'll bring the fish. I'll bring the fish, you know, because people are going to be there. They're going to be there all day. They're not going to have any food. I'll bring the fish. They're going to need some food. If we go up there to listen to you preach all day long, people are going to be hungry, they're going to be mad, they're going to be hangry. They're going to want some food. I can, I can solve that problem. Let me solve your problem. I'll go fish, you go do your thing, we'll meet somewhere in the middle. No, no, no not this week, next week, Jesus. My schedule's really booked this week. How about next week? We can do it then. Which is interesting because Jesus told Peter to do the, exactly the same thing. He said, you know what, Peter, I need you to do? I need you to feed my sheep. Peter is such a beautiful man because he is us. Every time something could go wrong, could go the other way, Peter did it. Almost without exception. But at some point, Peter was won over. At some point, Jesus proved to Peter that he was God. And it, it wasn't maybe before he died. If you remember, right up to the point where he was dying... Peter denied Jesus. Remember I said he went wrong every time? Every time Peter went wrong. And at, at the resurrection, when he came back, Jesus talked to Peter. He said, here's my church. And then Jesus was ascended into heaven. And then the church was there. And you know what happened? People looked to him. They looked at this flawed man to lead them, to guide them. And they went out in the world. And immediately... We're thankful that Peter is there because as soon as Christians started existing in the world, they started dying. They started dying. People were coming back to Paul. They're saying, they're saying, hey, this guy Saul keeps killing us, Peter. Why in the world are we following this Jesus? And Peter said, no, look, look, I've been down that road. Don't turn aside. Keep going. This is the way. There is only one way. I know that you're dying. I know that there are death sentences on your head. I know that the horrible things are happening to you. I know that you can't do business. I understand that you can't do the things that you wanted to do. But there is no other way. And they followed him, thanks be to God. And they followed him, thanks be to God. And they continued to follow him such that, that after they started dying... God grabbed one of those men who were killing the Christians. They said, Saul, get over yourself. Get on my side. And Saul became Paul, and he did. And then the two men had problems with each other. Just in case you think that people are supposed to be all happy and go lucky in church. No. No, you can actually have problems with people in church and still be the church and still love each other. Peter and Paul had big problems. But if they didn't have that, then we wouldn't have had all the letters that Paul had to write. 
to contradict Peter and all of the theology that Paul gave us so that we would know the mind of God, so that we would know how to be and act and live. And Peter, who did everything wrong, the worst of the disciples, on the day that they finally got a hold of him, they were going to kill him. Because you got to know, if you're a Christian, you're going to die. You're going to die over and over and over. And then at the end, they might actually literally kill you. And they did. They grabbed a hold of Peter, and they said, now we got you. And they were going to torture him. They were going to torture him as long as they could to make his death as painful as possible so that finally when he died, he would have had the most agony. And he said, don't do it. He said, don't crucify me like my Lord. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be tortured. They said, oh, fine, we'll turn you upside down. And they did. They put him on a cross. They turned him upside down. And he spent the last day of his, days of his life in utter, pure agony, upside down, while he died. And he considered it a blessing. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus. Think about being crucified upside down as a blessing. That's not a place I want to go or be. We're talking about what it looks like to be a Christian, the marks of a Christian. To be a Christian it takes certain things. There are marks. It doesn't just look like nothing. You're supposed to do something. There are lots of different churches in this world that say you should look like this, you should act like this, you should wear this, you should talk like this. But all of those things are external. God doesn't care what you wear. Here's the first mark of being a Christian. It's not perfection. The first mark of being a Christian is not undying devotion. Did you catch that? You're not supposed to be perfect. You're not supposed to unquestion your faith. You can question your faith all you want. The first mark of being a Christian is to recognize that God is God. God is God. We're not God. We don't understand him. We're just little squirrels when we come around him. Run away to our place, to our world, to hide in our holes. God is God. And the second thing is commitment. His way is the best way. It's not our way. It's not what we want. It's not where we're going to put God or meet him or compromise. It's his way. And there is only one way. There are a million ways that we're all going to die. There's only one way to life and eternal. So I'm going to ask you, do you bear the marks of a Christian? And if you're honest about it, if you're honest about who God is in your life, ask yourself, is he your king? Or is he your afterthought? You've come to worship today. I'm going to ask you the same question Jesus did. What are you looking for? Would you know it if you saw it? What are you looking for? Others are looking. 